By the time you're finished listening to this Pepsi Zero Sugar, you'll be 15 seconds closer to kickoff. Stock up now. Bengals game day is so close, you can almost taste it. Bengals watching. Better with Pepsi. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger, for thousands of appetizing ingredients that inspire countless mouth-watering meals. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week, and up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with points. So you can get big flavors and big savings. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. I'm Carol from Sunbury, Ohio. I'm a Republican, but I don't care who does the job as long as the job gets done. That's why I like Sherrod Brown. He stood up to both parties on China and worked with Republicans to fight fentanyl because Sherrod fights for Ohio. That's leadership. Paid for by friends of Sherrod Brown. Thanks for choosing this free Anfield Index podcast. If you'd prefer to listen to this or any of our other shows without adverts, then now's the time to check out Anfield Index Pro. With AI Pro, you can supercharge your entire listening experience. You'll not only get all of our podcasts without the ads, but you'll have them far faster with our quick publish feature available exclusively for subscribers. AI Pro also puts you in the heart of our sound studio with an option to listen to many of our shows live and interact with the podcasters in real time as the shows are recording. Upgrading couldn't be easier. AI Pro is available on all popular podcast platforms. Just head on over to AnfieldIndexPro.com and get started today. Hello and welcome to your post-match Raw podcasting to you from my field here in beautiful, rural Saturday afternoon, Ireland. I'm Trev Downey and joining me to give their immediate reactions to Crystal Palace nil, Liverpool 1 are Dave Hendrick and Jim Boardman. One of those games, Dave, where uh, my uh, focus was very much distracted by... Uh, a, a spectacularly awful refereeing performance and then the very frustrating sort of uh, play that we displayed in the second half which just left a, t- a team who are clearly you know full of good footballers but should mm. have been put to the sword so so much earlier it was it was as frustrating a, a half as we've seen under slot for me that second half um, I don't want to lean into too many of the narratives that uh, TNT were trying to push about Plucky Palace. But to be fair to them, they did register quite a few efforts in that second half. And without Ali, shall we say, or on a different day, uh, we may well have suffered for our sloppiness. Yeah, I mean, it was it was an olive game. Like, we were, we were very good first half, but a little bit frustrating. Like the front line just seemed a little bit disjointed. Everything else was was humming along well. They set up in a really weird way. And when we, when we get on to talking about them, we need to discuss just there, there's something off there at the moment. But first half, I thought we were really good. I thought the midfield functioned very well. I thought Gravenberg was excellent first half. The two centre-backs, we, we, we'll need to dedicate part of the show or maybe the whole show to them because Jesus wept, they're unbelievable. But it did feel like we were, you know, leaving something on the table, only going in one nil up at half time. Especially when you consider that they could easily have gone in level with that great chance that um was it Sarah or Enketia had that Ali made the great save from just at the death in the first half. Second half they came out, a little bit more purpose to them. Wharton goes off, Hughes comes on, and it's come out that Adam Wharton was playing with it, uh, pain-killing injections, which explains quite a lot about his performance. But when Hughes came on, it felt like him and Lerma got more of a, a foothold in that midfield and their aggression causes problems in a similar way to how Zhao Gomes and Lamina caused us problems last weekend with their aggression. And it felt like they had more purpose and, and a bit more a bit more of a, not a stranglehold because they, never, they were never in control, but they had more of a, of a stake in the game. And Ali, yeah, like you said, Ali comes up big a couple of times for us and then Yaros comes up big a couple of times for us. So we did ride our luck a little bit. I thought we were far too easy to play through in the second half, which hadn't been a problem in the first half. But there was moments in the second half where they breezed through our midfield, which was a bit concerning. 
But all in all, look, we've said it before. Anytime you go away in the Premier League and win, it's a good result. Selhurst Park has been a happy enough hunting ground for us. That's 10 wins and a draw in our last 11 visits there. But the 12.30 kickoffs are always a bit funky for us. But we're two for two this season so far. Two away 12.30s. We won both of them. We haven't conceded a goal. We have to be happy. I have to say, Jim, I'm very, very enthused by an awful lot of fun I'm hearing coming out of the mouth of Arne Slot. It's uh, always sort of the whatever the opposite of uh, a, a sort of emotive would be. Um, he plays stuff down. He takes the sting out of uh, comments that are, are driven to sort of pull a narrative from him. He spoke really well about the half twelve kickoff, so it was really, really good. I thought the way he dealt with it, uh, and of course, as Dave says, if you're actually looking at the history, uh, we do well there, uh, regardless. But it's nice that we have that kind of calmness because occasionally, just on the field, you can see that calm in the performance of the lads uh, on the field, and I don't know if sometimes we need a little bit too much into it? Is that a possibility? Because it just felt a little bit, again, for the 14th game in a row, that the main uh, sort of force that's driving against Liverpool is Liverpool's attitude to their play on the park. I'm not taking away from Palace. And I thought when Mateta came on, he really does look a massive handful and worried us and created a bit of carnage there. You know, Dave's right, we could do a whole show on on Ibu and Verge and how absolutely fucking magnificent they've been all season. Um, But, like, it's not to take away from Palace. It's just, it does have that feel to it, doesn't it? That, you know, there's always a gear there for us. We never seem to, I don't know if we've ever reached top gear on their slot yet, you know, for a consistent 20, 30, 40 minute, minute period. I don't think we have. What's your assessment of that so far in terms of the idea that we're our own worst enemy when it comes to uh, the threats of the Liverpool goal. I think we're our own worst enemy as fans sometimes as well. And this, I've been trying to think think about this one because, um, I mean, for example, how many games did we had where they scored first only for it to be reeled offside? It feels like that's happened a few times this season, and it's been you've thought to yourself, "Now come on, Liverpool, if that doesn't wake you up, nothing will." And you think, you know, is this just are we being are we being lax? And then you think, oh, is it more the other way? Are we actually so good? At defending that the only chances other teams are really going to get is going to turn out their offside. We're actually that good at it. And it is that sort of glass half full, glass half empty thing, isn't it? Which, whichever way you look at it. Yeah. And, you know, and I think being patient is something that is difficult in football as a fan. Um, because you just want us to get down the other end and score a goal, don't you? You just want us to get the ball out of the way of the box. You know, the whole, you know, the sort of, I mean, certainly like the, um, you get some old defender on Sky or, or TNT or wherever, it's always, what? It's into Rosehead. If you're in any doubt, it's into Rosehead. And it's this whole thing with football and this lack of patience. And um, I mean, the, the Liverpool sides that dominated in years gone by were very patient in the build up and all the rest of it. And um, I just think Slot's got that sort of patience. He's not getting, you know, the, the other side of this coin is he's not getting carried away when we do well. You know, players do well. He has a really good game and he kind of run him around them, you know, and, uh, you know, puts them back in the place or, you know, publicly plays it down. You know, he, he doesn't sort of really massively go out of his way to slug plays off by any means, not individually. Um, but at the same time, he doesn't go overboard on how good they are. He's just very careful with that as well. And again, um, the tweaks from this season to last season, I think that's the biggest one is that um, this thing about not forcing the pass, you know, not forcing the through ball, just hanging on a little bit longer. And that, I think, was what was testing my patience most today in the end was just the... Um, you know, the thing we've been guilty of in the past, just one pass too many, one pass too many all the time. You just have a go. But then, who am I to talk? Because then I was getting frustrated later on when Dom was having a shot and I thought, yeah, another pass, and that might have been might have been a goal. <laughs> so, you know, yeah. we're, we're all hypocrite, hypocrites as fans, aren't we, as well? Um, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, and the other thing, just to, just to go back on what you said as well, we saw, is the thing about being a manager of Liverpool, it's not just about finding the best players. It's not just about getting the best players to gel. It's not just about tactics and all the rest of it. A lot of it is about how you deal with the public perception. And, um, you know, it's a massive part of the role. And I think he's doing that really well. And maybe we've not picked up on that enough. I I, I agree completely. And 
there's nothing but evidence for it. And, and the thing about it is he's not, he has not cast himself and has not been cast in any sort of messianic role. He was to be a continuity guy uh, and he's more than succeeded at that. And what I love about it is that he hasn't um, in any way inflamed any scenario with the things he says. And he always looks as if He's just slightly underwhelmed by everything, no matter how good it happens to be uh, in the aftermath. And that is exactly the way. That's the Liverpool you and I, Jim, grew yeah. up with. The boring, we'll just take it one game at a time stuff that works really well because it just deflects all the stupid questions and it stops all narratives dead in their fucking tracks because yeah. we're just going to say, yeah, well, it was good, but it could be better. And we'll just take the next game. We'll focus on the next game. Love all that. Love all that. Just with you for a sec, can we just talk briefly about the Liverpool lineup? Because Dave kind of hinted he wouldn't mind a chance to talk about Palace. So I'll go back to him for that. A couple of changes made today. Um, obviously, we have very, very kind of dispiriting uh, aspect to this game, which is it looks as if Allison's done some sort of hamstring thing. He looks uh, distraught in yeah. the moment and afterwards. Uh, but at least he starts today and very, very, very heartening display by young Yaros coming on from the bench. But the changes were that he decides to start with Simicus. Uh, Jones gets a start in midfield as well alongside uh, McAllister and Gravenberg. And so Dom is out. And we go with Gakpo and uh, Jota and Mo up top. So that is interesting in and of itself. Uh, that means obviously that Diaz is on the bench alongside Nunes, Rabo, Juanza, Bradley, uh, Endo, Joe Gomez and the aforementioned uh, Yaros. It's not a bad looking squad regardless. We'll take it all day, every day. I think it was interesting. A lot of people were expecting Jim and I found myself being sort of, I don't know, not quite tut tut at that, but because I we we've brought up the concept of rotation a few times, and myself and Jan spoke about it. And at the end of the last raw, Dave and I were talking about um, Raymond Verheyen and periodization and all that kind of stuff. And I think most of us were just expecting that he'd roll his nominal best eleven out again. So it was a surprise, wasn't it? It was, yeah. I mean, that's the thing. I mean, that's the first thing I wrote down. You know, um, some change is good, but not too many because you don't want. You know, I mean, we talked, I think it was during the League Cup, I was on Raw for that with Guy, and we were just talking then about how the difficulty of rotating on mass like that is, yeah, you've got 11 decent players on the pitch, but if, if nine of them have rarely played together this season, then there's going to be some time getting used to things, isn't there? Um, and to me, where I always think the way rotation works is just kind of blending this team into the next one, which blends into the next one. And, um, you know, I, I mean, and for one thing, maybe keep other people guessing, but you've got players here as well who can play pretty much the same role. So you've, got, you've kind of got back up in, in most positions, other than maybe the most important positions, which is the one that's already been hinted at, it's going to get raved on about today, which is the in the back four, those two guys in there. Um, that's maybe where we're most lacking cover. Because, I mean, as we saw today, our third choice keeper came on in the end and wasn't wasn't too bad at all. I think I was quite impressed with what I saw of him in pre-season, which I admit wasn't a lot. And I admit was just pre-season. But, you know, there's not a bad... You know, not a bad third choice keeper there, you know. So um, you just hope, you know, and it, it is distressing to actually see him on the pitch. You just don't want to see him because that means something usually bad has happened. And I don't know what the state, state is with Kelleher. I believe he's not well. So hopefully that's just a bit of a cold and he'll be better by midweek. And we've got the, at least the choice of those two. Um, and yeah, I think, you know, you look at Gapo, oh, that's his best position, you know. And unfortunately for him, Diaz has hit the ground running this season. And if, if the manager is going to be reluctant to rotate and... Apparently training methods aren't as hard, so maybe players can play longer. If he is going to be reluctant to rotate, he's, he's knocking at the, the door that's going to be the hardest to break down, arguably. Um, but then again, I always say with Mo Salah, just because he's an absolutely outstanding player, it doesn't mean to say he should play every minute or even start every game, um, both from a fitness point of view. And also because if he's going off, off his game a little bit, which he can do from time to time, then you know I'm sure it makes him all the more hungry to get on and do well. Um, you know... And so as time goes on, maybe we'll see Diaz play on the right and things like that. But yeah, rotation is just, to me, is how we get through the season. And when you look at the bench and you look at the players on the pitch, we've actually not got, we've almost got two full sides of players, haven't we, that are, that are good enough. You know, um, you wouldn't necessarily put that side out today if it was the Champions League final or whatever. Um, but I would say you'd use a lot of those players getting to the Champions League final. Yeah, uh, and I, I think, you know, you hit on something there. I think we could easily, and Arne could have pulled the trigger, and that's uh, Luis Diaz for Mo move a lot earlier today, if we're being mm -hmm. honest. Um, and it kind of felt like it was one that should have been done. 
Uh, Dave, just to speak to you about Palace briefly, because I do feel we're going to get derailed on our usual kind of uh, topic and thread by the fact that the referee is such a, an appalling set of fellas uh, on his own. And the, again, just some several other like interesting in narratives that we can focus on. So I do want to get a little bit of acknowledgement about Palace, specifically to, to tweak and, and tease out what you're chatting about when you say that it doesn't seem that all is quite well there. Uh, it, it, there's a fine collection of footballers in that squad. Mm. There should be absolutely a top half, if not worrying, some sort of Europa or European Cup competition of some sort type squad there. Whether it will happen or not, of course, is another thing. When you need mealtime inspiration, it's worth shopping Kroger for thousands of appetizing ingredients that inspire countless mouth-watering meals. And no matter what tasty choice you make, you'll enjoy our everyday low prices, plus extra ways to save, like digital coupons worth over $600 each week and up to $1 off per gallon at the pump with points. So you can get big flavors and big savings. Kroger, fresh for everyone. Fuel restrictions apply. Ryan Reynolds here for, I guess, my 100th Mint commercial. No, 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 no. I mean, honestly, when I started this, I thought I'd only have to do like four of these. I mean, it's unlimited premium wireless for $15 a month. How are there still people paying two or three times that much? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be victim blaming here. Give it a try at mintmobile.com slash save whenever you're ready. $45 up front payment equivalent to $15 per month. New customers on first three-month plan only. Taxes and fees extra. Speed slower above 40 gigabytes. See details. This episode is brought to you by Honda. When you test drive the new Prologue EV, there's a lot that could impress you about it. There's the class-leading passenger space, the clean, thoughtful design, and the intuitive technology. But out of everything, what you'll really love most is that it's a Honda. Visit honda.com slash EV to see offers. I don't need a VPN. I've got nothing to hide. Ha. This is what I used to tell myself before I hooked up with LibertyShield.com. Not only is my home internet now fully encrypted, but I can now access all the websites I want, whenever I want, and do so from absolutely anywhere. As a Liverpool fan, I love to know I can now watch every match, regardless of whether it's on UK TV or not. My Liberty Shield VPN make sure nothing is blocked and guarantees me super fast streaming speed throughout that match. You can get connected right now with their software package, which includes a 48-hour no-obligation free trial and instant access to their apps for Apple, Android, Fire TV, PC, Mac and Android TV. Or go a step further like I have and get one of their pre-configured VPN routers. These small but powerful devices allow you to easily connect every device in your home to VPN, making it the perfect solution for smart TVs, Mac boxes and games consoles. Visit libertyshield.com today and use coupon code AIVPN25 to get 25% off at checkout. Yeah, it's a really talented group of footballers and like they're missing two key starters today. They're missing Czech de Curie in midfield and Shadi Riyadh, who I think would be starting in, at centre-back. But when you look at the players that come in, Jefferson Lerma is a very experienced Colombian international. He's a good player. And Nathaniel, uh, Trevo Chalaba is a good player as well. He's played in the Premier League for years now. So it is a strong team. Obviously, they, they lose Manu's early. The, the right wing back has to go off. They have to bring on Klein. That's a significant drop-off for them. They probably would have been better sh- shifting Sar to wing back and bringing on Kamada. And I actually thought, when I was thinking of this game yesterday, I actually thought they would start Kamada because when they came to Anfield at the end of last season, we were playing a 4-3-3 and they were playing a 3-4-3. But what they did was they boxed their midfield. So they sat the two central midfielders a little bit deeper in front of our midfield and they tucked the two wide attackers, Elise and Eze, in behind our midfield. And they just outnumbered us then. They had 4v3, and we couldn't find a way to play through them. We couldn't find a way to stop them. They were able to break us open multiple times, and obviously they ended up winning the game. And I thought they'd do something similar today, but they didn't. They they started with Eze playing very wide on the left, Sarah playing very wide on the right, 
and Enketia just sort of drifting on his own. And the two midfielders still dropped off and they played up against Alexis and against Curtis, which allowed Gravenberg lots of space. And if you think of, like, when Pirlo sort of developed or w- was, you know, developing in this kind of deep-lying playmaker role, people called him the quarterback because he was sitting in and he was just pinging the ball left, right and centre. And he had time and he had space and any of the defensive worries were made up for by the fact that he was so good on the ball. Now, Gravenberg isn't close to that level of passer, but Gravenberg is an elite-level ball carrier. And while this will only be relevant to people that actually watch American football, rather than playing that role as a quarterback, he's almost playing it as a running back, in that he's using that time and space he's got to pick the ball up, pick his gap and head for it. And in that first half, he had so much joy carrying through the middle of the field, even if it was just a thing where he was carrying it 15 yards. And then when one of their players came to him, then he was just playing the little simple pass in to the player that the man who'd come to him had left. And I just thought that setup was really weird from them. And they never got close to us first half. Like they never seemed to be right up against us. Whereas every time they got the ball, they had one of our players right in behind them. Like there was a real lack of intensity in their football, which is not something you expect from Crystal Palace, especially at home, especially with that, you know, strong support that they've got at Selhurst Park. And then as the game went on, there was that spell. They got like four yellow cards in about a six minute or 10 minute spell, including Sar got booked for, I think, gesturing that he, uh, that uh, Costas should have got booked. He started waving a yellow card. He got booked and he lost his head. And then Enketia lost his head and he got booked. And Will Hughes got booked in the midst of it. And Lerma got booked. And they all got booked in this really short spell of time and their heads just went completely. And then they managed to settle themselves down again. And then in the last couple of minutes, there was just some things that if I was a Palace fan, I'd be furious about. So does the ball played up where... Jota manages to spin Guehi and get in on goal and he tried to square it to Diaz but Lacroix came across and, and cut it out. If you watch the replay, watch Mark Guehi he never even turns to look he just sort of continues to amble forward puts his head down as if he's just given up. That's the club captain. Then there's the moment over in the corner flag where um, Endo has decided he's the new left winger and he's trying to play a bit of keep ball and he gets shoved over and the ball is going out for a goal kick and Endo as he's fallen just sort of flails his hand at it and knocks it out for a throw now they need a goal they're chasing the game here and nobody goes to take the throw in like nobody goes to take the throw in the players start arguing with the referee and then just walk away there's no urgency in them at all and then when Sar goes to take it, he takes a foul throw. And they all just look fuming with each other. And there just seemed to be a real attitude problem with them today. Whether they're laying down the tools against the manager, whether there's something going on that isn't public, whether there's been fallings out, I don't know. But with Gwehi and I thought Eze today in particular, they just didn't seem like their heads were in it. And that's been the case with them a couple of times this season. And I do wonder if maybe they were promised moves before the summer. Yeah, they're two lads whose heads could easily be turned. and probably. Yeah, because we know that Newcastle tried all summer to get Gwehi and the price just kept going up and up and up. And then Gwehi had to watch Anderson get sold and said, so like, right, you won't sell me, but you'll sell him. He gets to go and I, I don't. How's that fair? Oh, when you see, get when you get games like this as well, you get the your agents on the phone. Oh, you don't have to keep doing this. Let's keep pushing you for a move. And yeah, instead of listening 100%. to you both saying, "Here's how you tweet things. Here's how you do things better." You 100%. think, "How do we leave?" Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you've yeah, got absolutely. you've got Eze, who was brilliant for the last year, and Elise was brilliant for the last year, and then Eze has to watch Elise get the move to to Bayern for fifty million, and then when clubs come knocking for him late in the window, the last week of the window. Two Premier League clubs approached them over him and were quoted 80 million apparently when the price all along was supposed to be 55 to 60. 
Like, that's going to have an effect on players. Like, let's be really honest with this. No player goes to Crystal Palace as their destination move, right? Crystal Palace is a stepping stone club, and no disrespect to them at all, but there's a food chain in football, and players want to move up that food chain. So they go to a Crystal Palace in the hope of getting a move, if not to a Liverpool, a City, an Arsenal, then certainly to a West Ham level team. Because without question, that's a move up. Or a Newcastle. Or a Villa. That's a move up for them. They don't go to Palace to stay there. And what Palace will find is if they start to price players out of moves, agents will get wise to that. And then agents will stop being willing to let their players go there. Like, if Eberichi Eze's agent has other players currently playing in the championship and Palace are eyeing them up, and they've if he feels they've dicked over Eze, he's not going to be willing to let his next guy go there for fear of the same thing happening. Yeah. So, the, the, the just, there seem to be a real attitude problem with them today, a real lack of hunger, a lack of desire, a, a lack of... A lack of want a lack of want to go out and get that result today other than you know the few little bursts we saw in the second half and if I was a Palace fan all of that would concern me far more than the defeat you lost to Liverpool you lose to Liverpool at home every year you lose to the top clubs at home because you're not one of the top clubs that happens to all the mid-tier and below clubs what would concern me was the lack of urgency and and the seemingly just unwillingness to put the extra effort in. That would concern. Yeah, um, especially it focused on a couple of lads. They were, they were, I think they, the subs came on and, and, and sort of had a bit of liveliness to them. By, by oh, team. yeah, like Mateta and Hughes. But, like, Will Hughes is a player where Palace is is, is his destination. That's, yeah. That's the yeah. top he's going to get yeah, to. Now, yeah, that's unfortunate. Yeah. It's because he tore his ACL when he was young and he never quite recovered from it. He's a, by the way, Will Hughes, one of the biggest Liverpool fans you'll ever meet. A genuinely lovely lad and like a proper, proper red probably would have played for a club like us if not for that ACL. That's how good he was pre-injury. Yeah. But he's gone on to have a really good career. Alice is is his club now. That's his destination. So he's putting in all that effort. But for the lads that have, the younger lads that have that ambition to go higher, they're not putting that effort in. And it's not just going to hurt the club they're playing for. It's going to hurt them as well. Because if another, let's just say United had a scout there today and we're looking at Eze, they've got a way of thinking, do, do, is he another one that has a bit of an attitude problem? Yeah, can we really afford another one of these? Yeah, 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 yeah exactly. You know? exactly. Yeah, you don't yeah. want to play when you look at the lead table and you're way below where you want to be. They, they play shite, do you, if you're a Man United Exactly, scout. exactly. Yeah, yeah. That's, <laughs> that's not a good look for them at the moment. Did very much enjoy the uh, idea of Grab as a sort of dual threat quarterback, Lamar Jackson type. Dave, Lamar yeah. Jackson type is exactly it. Yeah, like Lamar that. Jackson, Michael Vick type, as opposed to Pirlo doing the Tom Brady, Peyton Manning type. <laughs> thing. Yeah, I like it. I like it. One for one for our American pals there. Uh, so before we move on to talk about the the match itself, and we'll do that as briefly as humanly possible, because there are some things to talk about in terms of incidents, but a lot of it was quite frustrating. I do want to talk about the the uh, the man in the middle today because it was this sort of spectacularly awful performance, and it, fan podcasts are going to get it right in the neck for being one eyed and um, you know uh, biased and all the rest of it. And you know, whereas I've listen, we're we're all Liverpool fans. What the fuck else are we going to be? But at the same time, we do try to maintain some sort of at least pretense towards neutrality when it comes to talking about objectively talking about the performances of our own players uh, and all the people involved on the pitch on the day. And I've never seen something quite as egregious, really, as the Simon Hooper performance today. And it, it wasn't it wasn't egregious in, in that kind of way where there were like there was terrible call after terrible call that were really sort of spectacularly obvious ones. It was just, how is it possible that we get to the stage in the game which we got to where you know, uh, th- there's literally nothing being given uh, in favour of Liverpool at all, no matter how molested the players are being. Uh, and every single thing seemed to go uh, in the opposite direction. And then it just started to get worse. 
And as the game went on, I thought he really, really lost control of it to the extent that he was pretty much bad then for everybody, as can often be the case. And this is where I do find myself coming down in favour of those people. I was speaking about this in AIP last night who say, look, it's not like a conspiracy that a ref is against a specific club or whatever. It's just that there's some of them are not very good at all. And when they get into run gym of being not very good, it can snowball like it did today with Hooper. Like that yeah. was a bad showing. And it kind of fucked the game up a bit. Yeah, and the trouble is, though, the referees, and, and this is the truth, right? Referees are human in most cases. They are human. They do make mistakes. They do get things wrong. They're protected by this sort of whole attitude of thou will not uh, criticise our referees, thou will be fined heavily if if thy does, you know, dare speak out against one of the referees. And so that that whole attitude is where, I mean, I'm not being funny now, if if you get to Monday morning, you go, if you were hanging around the AXA place on Monday morning um, and slotting the coaches or with any of the players, you'll probably hear them getting bollockings of some kind for the bits they did wrong, as well as praise for the bits they did right. And... You know that by the next game, there's a little bit of a tweak in how they play and what they do, and they've learned from that. But with referees, you feel like it's just going to be great big pats on the back. You know, they're all round together. Um, yeah. You know, the highlights. So look how much you pissed that manager off with that decision. Um, honestly, sometimes I think with cards with some of the referees, um, you could honestly have some sort of random generator that decides, was it a foul? Should we give a card? Which way should the foul go? And, you know, Hooper's one of those who does that. Um, but then... You know the the other side to that is there were so many decisions during the game that didn't make sense. The things he let go, I can praise him for one thing. He did play advantage once for us, but then I I take the praise away because I'm pretty sure it wasn't a, a great foul, and he never went back to even have a word with a player that had committed no, the foul. You no, know the ball went out for a goal no. kick or whatever. No. You know, and that winds me up because that was when Le, Le, yeah. wasn't it when Lacroix came across and just poleaxed Costas. Yeah, yeah, it was, and, yeah. Apparently he gave he he had a, he gave him a telling off. Whereas yeah. Alexis got booked in the first half for less of a foul on Eze, and they were allowed their advantage, and then they, they he went back to book Alexis. He went to yeah. Jones as well and said, you know, that's you know, and he did that, you know, where they point to the parts of the pitch where the offences took place. Yeah, you know, you've done one here, you've done it, so the next time you're going to get it. So it's kind of it's just random. It's as if literally he's a he's a bot, and someone somewhere's pressing a random button. Oh, after this one, give him the telling off about the three fouls. Next one's a yellow thing. You know, next one, just give him a yellow straight away. Um, it, it, I just don't know. It, it's just, it, it frustrates me that we talk as much about rest as we do. But what frustrated me more today about rest was the fact that if we were watching on TNT Sports, we had Fletch, who feels like, I don't know who he supports, but he, he, he gives up Evertonian vibes sometimes because he'll go on and on and on about one decision for so long. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it was about that penalty that... Yeah, yeah. How yeah. many times has Mo Salah or one of our players been dragged in the box, been pulled about, pull, 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 ref just plays on, and if anything, he'll give a free kick to the, to the defence. It's how football works, sadly. That's how it is. And yet this this incident where one of their players was had his hand held slightly for a small amount of time. I mean, in the end, the Premier League's own ref watch thing on Twitter I had to put a statement out about it, it, it just, yeah to, to, to help little Fletch understand and we will come to that into this never the game get so. near the ball either no 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 we will we, 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 no. we, we, that's one of what we'll focus on because that's one of those instances <laughs> I did very much enjoy you quoting the uh, King James referee bible there as well Jim the start of that <laughs> the dies and there it was very nice uh, no, Dave just, sorry just, come in on this on before Hooper. we just on Hooper like so I, I tweeted this at uh, 22-2. So that's, what, 10 minutes into the second half? Yeah. About 10 minutes into the second half. We have had 74% of the possession through 55 minutes of, of a football match. 74% of the ball. And zero free kicks had been given in our favour. Yep. Zero. That's they had point. had 26% of the ball and they'd been given 12 free kicks. 12 free kicks with 26% of the ball. Like, that is absolute. I don't care what anyone tries to tell me. There's just no way. It's not possible for us to have fouled that many times. No. <laughs> it's not possible for them not to have fouled us when we've had that much of the ball. A lot and of their yet- fouls were those where they, they play for the foul and we, we, we fall for it. And the ref should just go, they're playing for a foul. Yeah. yeah. That's nothing. Play on. And, and then just- we saw in the second half where there's a ball loose in the middle of the park, Ravenberg breaks onto it, knocks it past, I think it was Lerma, 
who'd already been booked, by the way, Lerma clearly boots him in the ankle. Like, very clearly boots him in the ankle. Gravenberg goes down. They get the ball back. They then attack. Gravenberg is still in a heap in the middle of the park. And they go down the other end. Now, if they had scored, I'm pretty confident it would have been brought back for that foul. And Lerma probably would have had to... See, the thing is, VAR can't tell him to give a yellow card. But he's missed a clear foul that's clearly hurt one of our players by a player for their team who's already been booked. He's just ignored it. But as Jim said, at any time one of their players gesticulated for a free kick, they were given. It was absolutely mind-blowing. And, like, I don't know if people are aware of this, but, like, Simon Hooper is he's the type of fella. Like, he's got his mother in his phone as Mrs. Hooper. His nickname with his friend, singular, <laughs> is Simon. He Such tried fun. to get hoops going once. Yeah. And oh, it just didn't catch on. With his one mate. <laughs> he is just an atrocious referee. And, like, you're both bollockly challenged, gentlemen. And you've both been... I would say at times on Twitter, given the nature of Twitter, when someone's having a go at you, they've made mention of your follically challenged status at some point over the years. The reason, <laughs> the reason that happens, lads, the reason that people use bold as a pejorative is because of cuts like Simon <laughs> Hoover. <laughs> because, because you'd be so rich, Phil, when having a go at him. You'd just be talking about anything. If it's he was wearing pretty... purple socks, that had come to mind. The yeah. Whatever top he's got on. Yeah. And the fact that he's got a big shiny bald head. He's just awful. It's pretty much he's him just... and Guardiola there. He's not like right, Clattenburg had the hair transplant because he's oh, you know. a better referee. It you know it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm, unfortunately, that made him even more of a knob head than he originally <laughs> was. Which is quite something. That, that and the custom number plate in his car. Oh, head. class. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, okay. Simon Hoopers what? just says Simon. Hey guys, it's Eddie Gibbs from Anfield Index here. I hope you're enjoying this podcast, and I'm sorry to call time on the show before it ends. In the current climate, it's tougher than ever before to offer podcasts for free. At Anfield Index, we produce over 75 free shows every month, which I'm confident is unparalleled in the LFC sphere. Whilst we'd love to offer everything for free, the production costs now make this impossible. That said, we don't want to follow the model of other channels and lock all of our content behind a paywall. So what we've decided to do is to continue offering every show for free, but cut that offering to 30 minutes on our longer shows. So to get all of our shows in full and enjoy the best of everything we have to offer, we really hope you'll consider supporting the channel and signing up at AnfieldIndexPro.com. For about the price of one cup of coffee, you'll get every podcast in full with zero ads. You'll also get access to our LFC VIP community, where you can enjoy live podcasts, engage with our podcasters, and chat with other Reds in real time. So that website again, anfieldindexpro.com. Join today. This podcast is part of the Sports Social Podcast Network.